Welcome back to the Fight Over Flight podcast. We have an amazing guest for you today who is going to absolutely blow your mind. He's an 18-year law enforcement veteran. He also has a speaking business, getting people out of adversity. Lost his, his father left him when he was five years old and never came back in his life. He suffered from kidney failure at the age of 24 years old. Kidney dialysis four days a week, hours a day. His sister gave him a new kidney, failing the police academy because of his kidney, and then bouncing back, getting through, and now changing lives. Losing his mother on Thanksgiving Day. This person right here is going to move your life. He is going to inspire you. Please tune in to hear his story. Joe Hammond, God bless. All right. All right. Well, welcome to Fight Over Flight. Joe, it's a pleasure to finally sit down and have a conversation with you. I feel like I kind of know you because of the Facebook group. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I love your posts. I love what you're doing there. I appreciate it, brother. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, I, and Joe, I met Joe. Um, so for everyone, this is Joe Hammond. Um, I met him at House of Worship. Correct. We met, I think it was maybe about a year ago. Yeah, in oh, the wow. church. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Church. Met him in, in House of Worship. And right away we clicked. Um, law enforcement officers, so we had a lot to talk about. But um, Joe, introduce you to, to the fan base. Yeah, my name is Joe Hammond. I run a, um, a page called JH Overcomes, and it's specifically based on overcoming adversity. Great. Um, I've been through a lot of things in my life, as I'm sure we'll discuss today, man. But, um, you know, overcoming adversity is something that I, I have uh, pretty much mastered, I like to say. You know, I've been through a lot of things, and, you know, um, you can find me at uh, JH Overcomes on Facebook, JH Overcomes on Instagram, or either just Joe Hammond. Cool. At Beautiful. Both locations, yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Hammond, everybody. That's right. And that's, and that's JH Overcomes spelled regular, Correct. right? Okay, Correct. good. Correct. Good. Yeah, everyone go check him out. Go follow him right now. Pause it. Go do what you got to do and come back. Um, so because I know your story and I know we spoke a lot about it and we could probably fill up five episodes of all the stuff that you overcame and, you know, to, to really give the listeners um, a background on you first, kind of let them know where you grew up, how you grew up, um, and then we'll just flow into into like the meat and potatoes of everything. I'll take it chronologically yeah. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, born and raised in Jersey. Oh, you know, great. Jersey, you know, about 15 minutes from the bridge. So, you know, we get that New York, that New York, New Jersey style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just good to go. Um, and make a long, make a longer story short about myself real quick in the beginning before we get into it. You know, my father left me when I was five years old. You know, he promised me on Thanksgiving he'd be back on Christmas. And wow, you know, here we are, you know, 40 something years later. I still haven't seen him. You wow. know, quite a few Christmases, you know, since then. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was one of the things I had to overcome first, you know, in my life as far as understanding, like, why? You know, why this guy didn't want me? You know, whatever the case was. But, you know, getting past that in my life, man, certain things, you know, <clears throat> will snowball. Yeah. You, know, you don't even realize what's happening to you, you know, because you don't want to admit that that's the case. You know, it could be because we're men, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, you know, men don't need anything. We're good, right? We right. got this, yeah. you know. But, um, you know, I suffered, you know, quite a few things in my life, which, you know, led to childhood obesity, you know, which eventually led to kidney dialysis, which eventually led to a kidney transplant, um, which eventually led to, you know, a better life, you yeah. know, a better life ahead. But so you know, some yeah. of the uh, I guess one of the main things that I think is going on nowadays that seems to be, I guess, getting started in that generation a little bit. Sure. Uh, fatherlessness. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What were some of the things that you were going through at the time where you can look back now and say, like, wow, that was really a poisonous mentality to have that really wasn't true what were some of the thoughts that you were going through growing up without a dad well you know what my mom really stepped up man like she was mm -hmm. always one of the people who you know even though he wasn't there she never looked for him mm, you know, right she didn't she didn't step up you know she didn't go back and say well you owe me this and you should take care of this she never forced anybody to do anything so I kind of learned that also you can't force a man to be a man right it's like you can't force a woman to be a woman mm -hmm. you know they're going to do what they want to do right but you know, overall, I had to learn a lot of things on my own and taught myself a lot of things. And some of it was was very beneficial, you know, and, you know, how I started to look at it was, you know, he taught me some of the best things in my life without him even being there. Wow. Right? Because he taught me how exactly not to be. Right. So by him not being there, he made me into a better father. By him not being there, he made me, you know, learn things on my own. Whereas where certain times people would pick you up in your life when you're young, mm -hmm. he wasn't there to pick me up. 
You know, the good thing was is that my mom, she remarried. <clears throat> Actually, she married because she never married my dad. Mm. But um, she married my stepfather, mm. you know, who became my father, man. He stepped in. and That's awesome. You know, he was, you know, he accepted me, accepted me and my older sister just like we were his. Right. You know, so that also allowed me to understand, okay, the value of being a step parent. Mm. You know, and, you know, right now, even in my relationship right now where I am, you know, my, my lady has a couple of kids, so it's easy for me to transition into that step role, mm. you know, into understanding that, listen, this is my responsibility as well. I think that's an important discussion. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think the differences are between fatherhood and then being a stepfather? Because mm. I've always been curious. Well, see, here's the thing. Anybody can be a father. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It doesn't take much for you to be a father. Just, you know, we got that, we got that all over the world, you know, but it's going to be that, that time, that understanding and realizing that, you know what? you have such a big influence on this person's life that you're about to be a part of. You're not just marrying this, this woman, you know, you're marrying the entire family. family. You're, mm. into, you're marrying whatever comes with that entire package, yep. not baggage. Yeah, <laughs> that's package. right. That's you know, right. I like that. Sometimes we, uh, we mistake packages for baggage. Right. You know, that's, that's not cool. And it's, it's interesting you say that because we talk about, you know, that there's a fine line, this resilient line that we talk about. And when it comes to people growing up without a mother or a father, like we had someone on the, on the podcast talking about that they were abused as a child by their mother and then taken away from the mother and staying with the father. So it's the opposite here where they grew up with a father without a mother. You grew up with a father, with a mother, without a father. And you both still took these paths of resiliency and overcoming. And, but it's a, very fine line because you see so many people that are on the other side where they fall into addiction, mm-hmm. where they fall into problems, where they commit crimes, where they commit suicide, all because of a bad childhood. Right, right. So that that line, um, it, it's thin. Yeah, it's thin. Very thin. You did, know? You, did you ever have like a, a concrete realization of like, I need to go from feeling affected by not having a father and not having the right childhood to this is mine to change. This is mine. I have to own my life and kind of take it into my own hands. 150%. Yeah. You know, I had to stop thinking that, you know, whatever happened to us is not always our fault. Mm. You know, what happens to us going forward, 100% your responsibility. Mm. So you can blame all you want on your past. You can blame all you want on the people who hurt you in your past and things like that. You know the difference between right and wrong. Right. You know, so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't fall into the category of saying, well, you know, my dad wasn't in my life, so I don't know how to treat women. Mm -hmm. My dad wasn't in my life, so I don't know how to treat my kids. You know, I took it upon myself to understand that I need to make a concrete decision that I'm going to be a better person. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember the day when I was younger, and uh, my cousin Mike, he'll tell you the story about how one day I said, you know what, Mike, it's hard being good, man. (laughs) It is. It really is hard being good because, you know, some people might judge that differently. You know, they might judge it as being, you know, a pushover or or soft, whatever the case is. But I made a concrete decision in my life. And I said, I remember the day I was sitting in the park next to my mother's house. And I said, you know what? I want to be a good person. Yeah. I mean, there's such a different morality and values. They're not uh, naive. Right. You know, I think that's such an important distinction because some people will grow up into a place where they they think because they're naive Mm. that they're automatically good. Yeah, but you have yeah. to have that fundamental understanding of the things that could go wrong. Absolutely. And take it into your own hands and say, I'm not going to be like this. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. Those are decisions that we make. It's, and it's conscious decisions. You know, throughout my life, I make conscious decisions to say, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Right. You know, and, and, but there's also that voice that says, eh, well, nobody will see. Right. <laughs> right. But nobody will catch you. you know, right. and, and, don't, and, I, and I haven't had a perfect life. I, listen, I, was, I wasn't always a cop. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? I got arrested before when I was younger. So I, I went through my you know, through my trials and things like that. And, you know, all of a sudden I'm, I'm sitting in a police station because I did a B&E, yeah. you know wow. what I mean? And it's like, okay, this is not part of that, as part of that good yep. that you said that you wanted to do. And I remember because I was just about to get that Michael Jackson jacket from my mother. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was tight. It was the thriller, you know, but everything was right. And um, my mom felt kind of, you know, bad because the police kept coming to the house and mm. she actually believed that I didn't have a part of it, you know? And then finally it just came to me and I said, you know what, this is not it. This is not the way I want to go. And I wound up, you know, confessing to whatever happened. Because, wow. and, and I've learned how to carry that throughout my life as well, is mm. taking responsibility for your actions. Mm. You know, if you did it, you did it. You know, a lot, right. of, a lot of things that we do in life, we want to sit down, we want to act like we didn't do it, but you can't lie to yourself. You can only right. hide your true colors for so long. And I love what you said, so. <clears throat> you know, saying, you can't control what happens to you, but you could control how you handle it afterwards. So it's saying? like my coach, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, my coach told me, control what you could control. Right. 
You can't control the weather. You know, in, in sports, you can't control making an error. It just happens. It hits a rock. It bounces off you, whatever. But you can control how you react right. to those mistakes. Or you can't control how you react to the situation. And that's in your full control. And if you can do that, like control your attitude, control how you treat people, control your work ethic, control being on time. So for you to make that decision, like right now, if there's a teenager listening or a young adult or an adult that is still going through that trauma of not having a father, not having a mother, and blaming and being a victim, mm -hmm. you know, let them know, I mean, you already have, but even more so on, it's one, it's okay yeah. to have those trials and tribulations. It's not like you said, okay, my father's gone. I'm sitting in the park. I want to be a better man. Right. No, there was a lot of a lot going on. Going on. Yeah. And whoever's going through it, they know that it's not too late. You know, and you're, you're an inspiration to that, to let them know that it's, it's not too late. It's, it's definitely not too late. I mean, I'm 48 years old. I'm still learning every day, you know, and as a, as a younger person, you know, what I would say is, is this, is that, you know, no matter what, that son is going to come up the next day, whether you got a father or not, mm -hmm. you know, no matter what situation you face, that day is coming where that son is going to come up and it's going to set whether you're happy about it or whether you're sad about it. It really doesn't matter. So, you know, I'll, I'll take this, this podcast for, for an example. You know, this is, this is something that I knew the day was coming. Okay, I'm here. Mm -hmm. The sun came up this morning, whether I was feeling good, you know, whether I was in a mood or whether I wasn't in a mood, I had to come here and produce. You know, so I've learned how to, I've learned how to produce my life that way in every situation possible. You know, so the fact that my father wasn't in my life, the world doesn't care about my father not being in my life. Mm, right. You know, there's my reality and then there's the world's reality. Right. So, you know, to, to build on that a little bit, my reality is, yeah, my father wasn't in my life. My reality is that, yeah, I did have kidney dialysis and a kidney transplant. My reality is, yeah, my mom did die on Thanksgiving Day. You know, yeah, those are all my realities. But the world's reality is it's just another day. Yeah. You know, you have your close friends and your close family. That's cool. But it's just another day. And that sun is going gonna to shine with you or without you. So yep. yeah. you decide to do. And uh, that's a powerful distinction. And I don't, you know, thinking of it that way, it is extreme powerful distinction. It's like a, a healthy dose of humility. Right, a hundred percent. And so I want to fast forward because I want to kind of talk about beef, like what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how um, you're doing two things basically simultaneously, like yeah. two career paths, and sure. but they're interconnected. And one's an extension of the other. Correct. So let's talk about that a little bit. And then we can go back to the timeline of, because we got a lot to talk about with you. <laughs> hey, man, let's I go. I mean, you're like, let's you're, 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 you inspire me. I watch your videos. Um, just meeting you at the church. Yeah. I know everybody listening now is going to be inspired. So let's talk about that. And let's talk about this big thing that's on your arm, too. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the elephant in like, the room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People are like, oh, man, he got beat up before the right. podcast. What happened? You know, exactly. so he had to yeah. get jumped in to be on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so be prepared. When yeah, it comes, exactly. You know, right now, it's not really a game when you get it. <laughs> right. So let's talk about the two career paths that you're taking now sure. and, and how they kind of help each other. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, law, I'm a law enforcement officer. Um, I got hired with the city in uh, New Jersey uh, in 2001. And, you know, since that time, you know, you mean on this side of the law, man, you see a lot of ugly, man, a lot of evil, you know, just one recently. Yep. Yeah. You know, with the Jersey City police officer being shot and killed. Um, and, you know, we get to see a lot of different things. But the one thing that we don't um, get to see is the, the after effects of what goes on in law enforcement when it comes time to, comes time to dealing with those things. So what I do is um, at JH Overcomes is I talk to officers about overcoming their adversities on and off the job, wow. you know, because listen, I'm a police officer, but it doesn't mean I don't have problems. Right. You know, I've, I've been through a divorce. I've been through illness. I've been through health problems. I've been through financial problems. I've had my car repoed as a cop. You know what I mean? So wow. these are things, you know, mortgage problems when I was going through the divorce and, you know, custody issues. These are all the real life issues that sometimes lead us spiraling down into that, that dark place. And because people think that we're police officers, eh, they think we're supposed to be able to handle it. Right. And, and it's not true. We're just we're just human beings doing a job. It's kind of un, an unrealistic expectation set on you guys. Correct. Right. And that's and that's what it is. You know, so when it comes down to that, that's what I do other than law enforcement. I help other law enforcement officers understand that it's OK. Like you just got mm -hmm. finished saying to go through certain things in life and be able to have to and, and, and have the need to be able to speak to somebody about it, talk to somebody about it, get it off your chest, because. You know, the one thing we do, like, you know, we have the psychological test before we get hired as police officers, right? The first thing they tell you is, well, if you don't pass a certain level of a, of a psychology test, 
you're not going to get what? You're not mm-hmm. going to get hired. Mm. So that's embedded in us early that if my psyche is not right, you can, can they lose fire your job? Me? I can lose my job. And, you know, because when you take the psychological test, the psych test starts right before you even get there. How you park your car. You <laughs> yep. know, if, you wow. know, if you don't back your car into a spot and they're looking out the window at you. So they put this thing into your mind that, okay, I got to start following the rules. Really? Right is that now. part of it? And yeah. It's absolutely yeah. Wow. right. You know, you get the meanest person ever to talk to you oh in the front. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Who told you to park your car that way? Yep. Now, you got to realize you're not a police officer at that point, so you're still a little bit intimidated, mm-hmm. you know, by the whole process. And then they put you in this ice cold room, you know, with this loud ticking clock, and then they give you 400 questions to answer, wow. and then they interrupt you in between that. And, and these are all things that go into your mind early, and you sort of carry that along with you in law enforcement because mm, if I didn't almost get hired because of my psych back then, What's going to happen to me now if it's all of a sudden I come across something that I can't really handle? Right. And what they don't talk about is, okay, I was psychologically great before I saw this. <laughs> you know what exactly. I mean? And before right. I saw this over the past five years, and all of a sudden now I don't want to talk about it because it's not cool to talk about it or I'm afraid of losing something. Right. So that's what I do also. I, I speak to police officers and anybody else about overcoming their adversity mm-hmm. and dealing with the real life part of their lives on and off the job. And not, and I mean to cut you off, but th- this is a perfect point for any law enforcement officer that's listening, any military personnel that's listening, anyone that's listening that needs help, needs advice, but specifically in this area, you need to know that you can reach out to Joe. You can hit him up on Instagram. He, he's Trust me, I know he's going to reach out back. He may probably most likely give you his number, yeah. you know, right? Yeah. right? And, yeah. and talk to him if you're going through something because – Divorce, financial problems, seeing death on the job, yeah. you know, taking away a father on Christmas because he beat his, mm. his wife yeah. in front of the kids. Yeah. That stuff is traumatizing. Mm. And because we're supposed to, and, I, and this is like the phrase that I hate the most and I say it on the podcast, we're supposed to man up. Yeah. We can't talk about it. And that's where it's a downward spiral mentality. And we, in this podcast, in your movement, are going for a spiral up mentality. Absolutely. And the only way to get that is by reaching out. So if you don't want to reach out to us, reach out to Joe, and we're going to get you through it together. So I just wanted people to hear that, let them know, especially in our fields, because we think that we can't talk, and that's why suicide rates are so high, and that's why addiction is so high. And listen, when you reach out to, to me or to Robert or anybody, you know, I can't promise I can help every situation, but I am going to lead you in the right direction. That's right to get you to somebody who can help you professionally if, that, if that's what the need is, you know? And I, I, want, I want to build on that, that, that man up thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? That is, you know, I remember when, you know, I saw a couple of things on my job where, listen, it, it really, really affected me. And I didn't go get help until um, somebody actually made me, my higher-ups made me go to get the assistance that I needed because wow. they heard my voice on the radio and they were like, that's, that's not the way Joe usually conducts himself on the radio. And... At that point, I was like, okay, I'm good. I got this. But when I started talking to somebody, that's when I started to realize that I really needed to talk about this. Mm. And the courage that it took to talk Mm -hmm. about it, you know, that's where that real manhood comes in or womanhood comes in. The courage that it takes to go and talk to somebody and say, listen, bro, I got to talk to you. That's right. Going through a situation. And and because you have to, like, drop a certain part of of your pride. And your shoulders got to drop a little bit and all of a sudden now you're, you're the one that's being spoken to and helped. Right. When you're so used to helping everybody else along the way. Yep. So it's, it's, it's that's right. And even, and even to, to piggyback off that we would go and help complete strangers on a drop of a dime. Like we get a call, we help them. You're a criminal. We help you. If we get into an incident where you fight us, we have to arrest you. But then we, we put aid, like yeah, yeah. we help you, we, you know, we, we make sure you're okay. We get you the proper need. Why not do it for our brothers and sisters in law enforcement Absolutely. or in the military? Why is it a stigma that I can't tell you that I'm going through something because I'm worried that you're going to think Rob is one getting soft right. or Rob now has psychological issues. Should they take away his gun? Right. Should they this? No, I'm just going through some stuff that I need, you know, a brother or sister to talk to. Yeah, I think it's a... A uh, problem in leadership overall, right? Like mm. you're you're a leader as a as a police officer, so you get used to being in that role of leading and giving and giving, and all of a sudden, you don't have anything else to give. True. And where are you supposed to receive? True. True. Yeah. And and you're absolutely right about that. It's the it's the leadership role that you take 
you have to, again, you have to take a step back mm-hmm. and have somebody help you for a change. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's very, very difficult for a person who's used to doing what he's been doing all his life. You know, like, like we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, yeah. the shoulder. Thing. Good segue to you get know, to and that. The, uh, you know, I just had, I had surgery on the shoulder. And not understanding how much it takes to use your, your body every day. Like, you use your shoulder every single day. Like, I just reached down and grabbed this cup of tea, you know, and um, I took a sip of it. If I tried this with this left arm, I guarantee you I'd probably pass out. Oh, man. You know, but that's what I'm trying to say to you. The, the, the ability to be able to ask somebody for help. You know, I have my daughter. I live alone with my daughter. She's 15. And uh, my lady, uh, she, you know, she'll say to me all the time, well, why don't you just ask me for the help? Right. You know, what, what, are you, what are you doing? And it's something very simple as pulling up a blanket or something very simple as putting on your jacket. I had to have somebody help me take my jacket off when I got here. You know, but it's, it's that independent mentality that we have that's very very hard for us to break mm-hmm. and we know that we should be doing better and we know that we should ask for the help but there's just something that's back in here to saying eh, i got it I'm right. good. you know so even just like the the shoulder injury and i had i had to learn a lot through this and this is another adversity i had to overcome because with this i realized that i'm not as as strong or indestructible as i really think i am Right. You know, compared to God, we're just you know, <laughs> yeah. a, a speck of sand on the table, yep, you know, yep. I mean? we're nothing, we're zero, you know, but um, that was something that we had to learn, so, is depending on other people, depending on other people, so yeah. Now, because um, it's a good way to actually segue into law enforcement, now you've been a law enforcement officer for how long? Uh, since 2001. Since 2001, yeah. so 18 years. Yeah, about 18 yeah, years. 18 yeah. years, crazy, yeah. right? Yeah, and yeah. then flies by. And... Look, and now you're getting hurt. 18 years. You got, got hurt probably your first year on the right. job. Now 18 years right. on the job. It's like no one's immune to, to not getting hurt. But what was your path like mm-hmm. to get into law enforcement? Mm-hmm. So I know this a little bit, but I think yeah, yeah. Yeah, the listeners definitely need to hear it. Like yeah, right law, before getting in. Yeah, law enforcement wasn't always uh, easy for me to get in. And mm-hmm. I, if, you, if, you, if we go back to the top of the podcast, if you guys just started listening, go back and listen. You know, <laughs> right. um, Going back to the top of the podcast, we spoke about how, you know, I, I got into law enforcement, but it was, this was after me going through kidney dialysis for five and a half years, wow. you know, and kidney, and a kidney <sighs> transplant. Um, I was actually on dialysis briefly because of my seizures. So mm. I vaguely understand. So, that. so understanding that what it took for five and a half years to be, you know, 1500 needles in and out of your body and, mm-hmm. you know, your kidneys just shutting down. But that happened with childhood obesity. You know, again, it all, it all cycled into something else. And, what happened was I wanted to be a law enforcement officer so bad, but I was on kidney dialysis. I wanted this so bad that I was even taking tests because I thought I was speaking into existence. I'm thinking into existence of exactly what my life is supposed to be mm-hmm. and what I want it to be. And no, no matter what, nothing was going to stop me from being in law enforcement. So I go and I take tests and I'm taking, it took me about five years to get hired with, with the department that I'm with now. And I go and they actually offer me the job while I'm on dialysis. Wow. And I mean, I didn't tell him I was on dialysis until the point where we got to the point. And it, it was so funny because the, the mayor looks at me and says, well, um, you're on dialysis. And I said, yeah. And they say, well, what, how did you how do you expect to do this job? I said, I don't know. I didn't really expect to get this far. You know what I mean? So it was like it was, you know, it was something. And I had to back away at that time, you know, and I had to turn the job away and I had to go back and, and just to realize, okay, I made it that far even while being on dialysis. Okay, mm-hmm. what's going to stop me now? Nothing's going to stop. So clearly I'm qualified for it. Clearly I can do this, but I just got this one thing. I'm hooked to this machine four times a week, three times a week, oh, four hours man. a day, you know, which was like a job. So to fast forward, you know, after finally getting off of dialysis through a kidney transplant from my younger sister, you know, God bless, oh, God bless man. her heart, God man. Bless it, was her, yeah. a, uh, it was a life and death decision, you know, and, and again, it was Man, something that I had crazy. trouble taking from somebody else at that point. You mean I'm going to take your kidney? Right. And she says, well, Joe, this is, this is life or death. You have to make this decision. So finally, after making the decision, I, I decided to take the kidney, which was great. And here we are since February 2000. You know, 20 years later, man, I'm feeling, oh. I'm feeling fantastic. Wow. You know, she oh saved my, my life. You know, and, you know, to go to, to continue forward with that, I continued taking the test. You know, I'm taking tests all over the state, all over the country even. And when I finally made it through the process, I finally got hired again, which was great. And, you know, I, I went and I sat before the same, the same mayor. And they said, I think I know you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, it was just, it's a long story. We'll talk about it later. You know, we'll talk about it another time. You know, so 
to fast forward even more, I get into the police academy and I'm feeling great and I'm feeling, you know, fantastic. But all of a sudden the body starts to shut down because I got hired too soon after the kidney transplant. Oh, wow. And um, a friend of mine that I actually went to high school with, he was my instructor at the time. And he says, listen, man, he says, I don't need a hero. He said, I need a friend, mm. you know, and I think that you're, I don't think you're going to make it through. And I said, so how do I go back and tell my family that I'm not going to make it through the academy? They brought all the gear, you know, yeah. the, the church yep. is celebrating, you know, yep. you're the first police officer in the family, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, how do I go back now after being kicked out of this lifelong dream of mine? You know, and it hurt, you know, and I went, I remember crying all the way home from the police academy and I remember, you know, all the stories that, that I've heard prior to people getting kicked out of the police academy. They never send you back. You're never going back no, again. Wow. Trust me. You, you know this. Yeah, not, yeah. Once you get kicked back, kicked out, your department's not going to send you back. They got other people to, to fill your spot. Right. So to get into the, the true aspect of understanding the overcoming of that adversity was I had to fight my way back. And they hired me back as a parking enforcement officer. Mm-hmm. You know, so I had to go out and write tickets yep. and, and all those things. And, you know, all the time, the people that were telling me that you're never going to get hired again. You're never going to, why even bother staying here? I said, I don't know. I just got, got, got this feeling. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I got hired back and I went back to the police academy and uh, I made it through. That's you know, a wow. crazy here roller coaster. Yeah, wow. Here I am. I know people that just once, if they're like, yeah. a pebble gets thrown in their way <laughs> and they're like, no, this career is not for me. I'm not doing this. I right. can't do this. Yeah. All right. So that's a lot to even digest. Sorry about that. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's incredible. But I think because there's, there's different aspects that, that I want to hit. And I know there's definitely going to be aspects you want to hit. Yeah, for sure. So I'll, I'll go with one and then, then okay. you, can, you can go with one. Um, take us through because a lot of people like to see a success story and say they don't know what it's like to struggle or that they're an overnight success right. or this or that. right, And they just make excuses because they can't find it in themselves to fight through whatever they're going through. So you had to obviously have it easier, right? So when you were going to dialysis four times a week for four hours a day with all these needles in you, that didn't actually happen. You were like, you went to dialysis one day and then you got your kidney the next day. So for four or five years, can you kind of take us through the mentality of, you know, I have to wake up, I have to go to dialysis. What's my life look like? How old are you? Are your, all your dreams and aspirations crushed? What brought you back to life? Because I know that there was times where you're like, my life's over. I'm not going to do anything. So can you, so for the person now that is either going through dialysis or is suffering from something right now, needs some kind of transplant, can you kind of take them through that fight? Yeah, my, my overnight success was a long night. <laughs> you know I mean? It was a long, long night. And, and getting into the, the, the part of the dialysis, you know, I was 24 years old when the doctor called me. And I recall because I just had my son not too long ago. And the... The phone call, I remember the phone call, and the doctor just said, listen, you, you got to go on dialysis. Now, this was prior to me having a whole bunch of years of my life having high blood pressure and not taking care of it mm-hmm. and just thinking, I'm okay, I'm good, whatever the case is. The doctor said, it'll go away, you'll be all right, you'll be mm-hmm. fine. You know, so if, number one, if you have high blood pressure, start taking care of it now because it'll shut your kidneys down. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I'm trying to say is when, when I got the phone call saying that I had to be on dialysis, at 24 years old, you don't even know what this is. Right. You know, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. You know, what, you know, so I ran into the room and I told my mom, she was, you know, she was actually in the other room, still living at home at that point. And um, yeah, at 24, I was at home, I know. And, but, <laughs> I think so was I. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> you were the you know, job. Go, and, and my mom, she's like, well, well, what do you mean? Because at that age, I'm going to the doctor on my own. You know, she doesn't have to go with you. She's, mm-hmm. you know, you're an adult. You know, so when she tells me this, she's a nurse. Mm. And she's like, are you, are you kidding me? And I was like, no, ma. So she calls the doctor and, and they said, well, we got to get you in like right now, like today. Wow. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll come in Monday. You know, no, we need you to come in today. That's how high the, the poisons are in your, in your bloodstream. Right. right. So I get there and, you know, right away they put a shunt in my neck and I'm walking around with this, this, these needles in my neck and things like that. And my whole life has been changed at that moment. Yeah. You know, there's no just going back. There's no, okay, this is going to be over tomorrow or next week, or this is not going to be a temporary dialysis. This is something that's going to be a long-term thing. So hearing that at 24 years old and having overcome so many different things already with dad and, Mm -hmm. you know, with with my father and and things like that in my past, you know, there's so many different things that I've already overcome. Okay, I'm, I'm just getting hit and blindsided again. So now I got to go be attached to a machine for four hours a day, three times a week. 
that's a part-time job. You yeah. know what I mean? Like if you think about it, people work three hours, mm-hmm. you know, four hours a day. And so now I got to find a way to keep this mental, right? Because your attitude is a whole big part of how you overcome things. I'm, t- I'm telling yeah. you right now. Mm-hmm. And I would find a way to, to walk into the dialysis center just smiling. Mm-hmm. You know, find a way to just say, I'm, I'm not going to be here for long. And this was wow. a conscious choice on your part? A conscious yeah. choice. As hard as it was, man, because at home I cried. Right. You know, I'm not even going to lie to you. I cried my eyes out, you know, but it was important for me when I walked into this environment to say, you know what, I got this. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not going to be here for long, much like, you know, that's, that's the whole way I take, you know, I take life on. This is all a stepping stone for us, Every, everything we do, you know, but, you know, walking into dialysis and seeing all these people, a lot of them older than me, and, and one lady, she looks at me, she says, I don't know, how, how do you smile coming in every day? And I said, well, because I'm not going to be here for long. Yeah. yeah, and it's draining. Dialysis is so super exhausting. Draining, super draining. The cramps, the the vomiting, the yeah. you know the medicines and things like that that you have to take so that your body can maintain. And then not only that, then you got to go home and you want to play with your son. You know, you want to mm. lift your son up, but you can't really do it because you're so tired. You know, your body's just cramping because now you can't drink as much. You're not even using the restroom as much as you used to because your kidneys are not working. Right. So in, in fact, you know the the kidney dialysis machine is acting, is functioning as your kidneys. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Then I went on to home dialysis where I just got an infection, you know, and it just, things spiraled from there. You know? And then I had to go back to being on what's called hemodialysis where they actually do the blood and they put the needles in your arm and one takes all the blood out of your body, filtrates it through, it through a machine and puts it right back in. And you, know, you have to function throughout the day. You, wow. know? And with, you know, with the financial troubles that go along with that and you still have to work, you still have to find a way to make your life work. You know, these were a whole bunch of things that came along with the process of dialysis. It's not just the dialysis part of it. There's the financial issues. Mm-hmm, There's the, yeah. the fact that you can't work the way you want to work. You can't even do the things around the house you want to do because you're so tired, you're so drained. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's medical things, bills and all that stuff. Medical right? bills, all that. Yeah. You know, and then you got to walk around with these ugly scars on your body, you know, which I kept, by the way. You know, <laughs> scarred for life, baby. Mm-hmm. I love yeah. it. I love it. And I'm, I'm going to keep them purposely. You know, but that was the process I had to go through of overcoming another point por- another portion of my life wow. you know, this is something that okay let's what's next yeah you know, what's next you mentioned a few times uh you you kind of hinted at church and and you know you said you know thank god for for your sister giving you a kidney and stuff i kind of want to get a glimpse into what your spiritual life was like going through all that stuff and mm-hmm. how how that's changed or evolved or yeah. with without a, without spiritual grounding none of this was possible mm-hmm. I, I i can promise you that wow. i was i was in the church early as a young, just, you know, in the cherub choir, you know, marching down the aisle, you know, singing my song, we're crossing yeah. over one by one, you know, and, um, you know, I remember wearing a little purple robe and, you know, doing things like that. And I, w- I thank my mom, you know, for exposing me to that, even though we didn't want to go. We, you know, a lot of times when you're in church, when you're young, you don't realize what's going on. Yeah. You know, you're playing Holy Ghost and you're playing all this <laughs> other stuff, but there's something being embedded, you know, within you when you're sitting underneath that environment. And it, and, and it carries with you throughout your life if you allow it. See, God never leaves us. We're right. the ones that, that leave him. You know, and I had a friend, it's funny, a friend of mine reached out this morning. He said, do you really believe that God speaks to you? I said, oh, absolutely. Do you believe that he hears you? Oh, absolutely. You know, because he's the one that breathed his breath into us from the very, very beginning. So we carry him with us wherever we go. Now, how you choose to carry it is totally up to you. Right. So, so many people say, well, you know, if I'm going through this, how come, you know, God put me through this? Well, you know, if, if there's really a God, then how can it? Well, listen, you know, what, what are you doing or what are you not doing? Right. You know, because at the end of the day, you know whether you can look yourself in the mirror or not. And you know whether you're doing the things you're supposed to be doing or not doing the things you're supposed to be doing. Let's, let's keep it real. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's, let's have that moment of transparency where we say, okay, uh, yeah, that wasn't right. I shouldn't have did that. Mm-hmm. Or I shouldn't be acting out this certain way. But without spiritual grounding, man, none of this would be possible for me because there's always something in the back of my brain that's saying, this is temporary. You're going to get through this. And that sun is going to come up right. again, no matter what, whether you're on dialysis or not on dialysis. Right. There's whether a season for everything. There's a season for everything. And yeah. once you get through that season, you look back and say, you know what? It made me stronger. Yeah, I think, stronger. I think there is a big uh, amount, a large amount of people that kind of look to the traumatic parts of life mm-hmm. and they tell themselves, God is doing this mm-hmm. to me for this reason or because I did that. And I think it's important that we talk about how that's not, not the case. Mm. You know, God will take those horrible moments and draw good from them, but he's not causing them. Is he doing it to you? or Is he doing it for you? Right. You know, and that's one thing we have to realize too, is because there's certain things that you're being built for going forward in your life that you don't even see yet. 
Right. Like I never thought that I would be a professional speaker. Like I always, I always saw myself singing in Madison Square Garden. <laughs> you know, now I'm going to be speaking in Madison Square. Garden. What kind of music? You know, whatever, it, whatever it was. <laughs> R&B. I, was, I was good to go. It was definitely R and B. You know, yeah. um, and I, I, I was Michael Jackson. I don't care what anybody says. I was Michael Jackson. Okay. Um, but in any case, when it when it comes down to it, you you don't know what you're being prepared for. What's mm. around that corner? And every single time I look back. I was being prepared for this very, very moment, and I didn't even realize I was being prepared for because what you're going through right now, you're going to need that strength that's being built up within you to get to the next level. I mean, you're a fighter, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't train, if you don't go through the hardships of getting in the gym every other day or every day and boxing and sparring with somebody, you know, you're not going to be ready for that real fight. Yep. You know, that's what that sparring partner is all about. Mm. You know, so all these times and throughout your life, you're sparring. Right. You know, you're getting, I love you're, that. You're getting prepared for something. Because when it's time to fight, you got to fight. There's no time to run away. Right. Right. Um, fight or flight. You know, so fight over flight. But there's going to be a time where you have to look that adversity right in the face because it's mm -hmm. not going away. You know, this is this is your son. This is what you need to look at straight in the face. And you need to be able to conquer that no matter what the situation is, because nobody's coming to help you at that point. Mm. Nobody's coming to save you. There's been those times where I've laid. I, I recall, you know, being in the living room just. That fervent cry, man, we just break down, okay, God, I don't know what this is you have for me, but I still got to trust you. But get it done quick, right. okay, because I don't know how much longer I can hold on. You know, and you may take that little arrogant approach towards God every once in a while, and something about me thinks that he's okay with that. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I know when my daughter, you know, she'll snap at me every once in a while. It's, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> good with that, you know, because it's showing me, one, that you're not yeah. a pushover. Right. right. But it's also showing me that you're getting stronger and understanding that if you don't, stand for this, then you're not going to stand for other things that go on in your life. So understanding that your season that you're in right now, what you're being built for, that process that you're going through right now is way more important than the goal itself. Yep. Whatever you're being made as right this second, understand it's made specifically for you. And that, and that fight is important. And we talk about it. And every time Angel knows, every time the, the word fight gets thrown up, I just get excited. I go, I go, yes, so yeah, talking so about yeah. fight, right? I get excited. Um, but when you have to look the devil in the face, no matter what that devil is, yeah. whether it's in your health, your finances, a, a real life situation, you know, and walking with your daughter and someone comes up to you to try to attack you, anything. Yeah. When you have to walk through the valley of shadow of death, when you have to do that because you are in all aspects of your life, there is no backing away. No. There is none. There is going through. Mm -hmm. And it's what we talk about. It's like in a boxing match or in a fight. If you backing away from a flurry of punches, mm -hmm. you are temporarily putting yourself in a good position until you're in the corner. Yeah, man. And then right. you get knocked out. Yeah. So you have to go through. And I love when you're talking about God because what we talk about is no matter what, whether you believe in God or not, you're going to walk through that valley. Yeah. Yeah. Would you yeah. rather do it with God when you get knocked down and you can just pull your hand up and he'll lift you back up or do it by yourself? Yeah. And that's a, that's a choice on your own. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you said it because I like to say God's knocking at everyone's door right. and he's a gentleman. He's not going to walk into your house unless you invite him in. So when people say, I don't feel God, I talk to God, he doesn't listen. Well, have you fully surrendered your life to God? Mm -hmm. Have you? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't. Two years ago, I did. Right. And, and I knew a life without God. And I didn't hear him. And I didn't speak to him. And because I didn't surrender myself to him. And then once I did, I smell things differently. I taste things differently. I hear him. I have conversations with him in my car when I'm driving. And I approach situations differently. Yeah. I also think that having that perspective of having, being able to talk to God, being able to pray, it sets our minds up for an eternal perspective, right? We're not yeah. looking at just today, just this year, just this lifetime. We're looking at the, the concept of eternity with God. Mm -hmm. And so when we say stuff like walking through the valley of the shadow of death, like it, it's a, it's the shadow of death. Yeah. It's not actual death. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have the confidence in saying, regardless of what happens, as long as God is with us, we'll be able to get through it because it's not an actual threat to us. It's not an actual threat to our soul, maybe to our bodies, sickness, traumas, you know, losing, losing uh, close ones. But it's, it doesn't affect our eternity. Love that. Yeah. Yep. Love that. It, it doesn't affect your soul is what is what's going on. Right. To eternity. You exactly. know, what's happening to my body right now. I got this. This is what you know, this is what's, what it's going to be. And the one thing that that you said about um, looking the devil in the face. Mm. It, it's, 
listen, it's, it's not for everybody at that moment. <laughs> you know, you, you better be prepared to look evil in the face. If you, if you, because what's going to happen is there's going to, and it's not, it has nothing to do with ego. It has nothing to do with you being a man or being a woman or being strong. It's, it's the fact of looking that evil in the face and saying, let's go. Mm. Because I'm not going back. I'm not, I've come too far. And that goes back to the second time when I was almost kicked out of the police academy again. I had to look myself in the face and look at my friend and say, I'm not going back. So either I die here, right here, in this academy, mm. or we don't do anything else. <laughs> because what's going to happen is you need to look that adversity in the face. And, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about you have to take that shirt off and, and face it. And, and like you said, if I come across a situation with my daughter, it's, it's, it's about to be on. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to back down from this. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with ego. But if you're not prepared for that, right. if you haven't trained for it, if you haven't struggled through certain things in life, you're not going to be prepared for that battle when it comes no matter what your battle is. So all the things that I've had to go through as a young person, it was preparing me for the, the dialysis. It was preparing me for the, the rejection from the police academy, failing motor school, failing SWAT school, you know, failing a whole bunch of other things that came along with me. You know, and it was preparing me for that big one, which just happened this last Thanksgiving and my mom passing away on Thanksgiving morning. You know, and if I hadn't been built up from all those years of finally making through and pushing through those other hardships, I wouldn't have been able to push through this one. You have to be able to fight when it's time for you to fight, and there's no running away from it because somebody's nobody's coming to save you. Yep. Yeah, I think that's such an important message, especially if you're on the younger side, um, to be able to take on every little piece of adversity you can just to practice. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if something is happening and you're you're nervous about it or you don't know how to confront it, confront it any way you can and gather that information. Learn from that so that when you do get to a point where you're facing trauma and you're older or you're facing something horrible like what just happened to you this past Thanksgiving, um, you are prepared and you can be the person that people come to in those times instead of having to go to somebody. Right. And it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Exactly. It doesn't mean that it's not heavy. Yeah. You know, but, you know, are your shoulders broad enough to carry it? Yep. And that's what it's going to come down to if you don't have the proper training. And as a younger person going through, go through that little trial. You know, walk up to that girl and ask her, man. You know, walk up to that, you know, walk up to that, that, that guy and ask him, you know, it's, because that's going to be something, okay, well, let's I'm a little nervous about this, but, you know, but I got through it. Yeah, you know, I don't care how small it may seem for somebody else. It's monumental. That's right. You know, for me walking up to somebody right now in the street and saying something to them, it's, it's, it's nothing or getting on a stage and saying something, it's nothing. But for somebody else, it's just paralyzing. Yep. Amen. Yes. Yep. You know, it's paralyzed. So, well, you know, my fight is not your fight. My war is not your war. And whatever you're going through right now, you're going to have to look it in the face one way or the other because it's not going away. And what I love, you just said, we all have our different fights, but each person that we've interviewed who've had cancer, abused as a child, sure. injuries, all this stuff, it seems like the foundation for all of these resilient people, no matter how different the fight is, is the same. Mm. It's grounded in God. Mm. It's being able to be surrounded by loved ones, like how your mom helped you, you know, being able to, to tell your parents, if you don't have parents, you know, your grandparents or your siblings your best friends, be around people who truly, truly care about you that you can be fully vulnerable to yeah. and they can help you out. And then three, what well, there's four, three, speaking about it, having the courage, as you said earlier, to tell someone, hey, I'm not okay. Hey, I'm feeling broken. I need help. So asking for the help. And then the fourth one is like a bonus where once you get through it, what you're doing now, you're reaching your hand back and pulling people up. Mm. So it seems like no matter what life someone's living, no matter what trauma it is, no matter what their fight is, if it's based in, the, in that foundation, it seems like they, it's what gets them through. Sure, sure. Well, going, going back to number two, what you just got finished saying, being, being surrounded by the right people. Mm. That matters, man. That really, really matters. If I didn't have the right people in my corner, see, everybody that's on your team is not, is not for you. Let's, 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 let's just keep it real. You know, just because they're by your side doesn't mean they're on your side. You got mm -hmm. people that are going to talk about you, say negative things about you. If you're not surrounded by the right people, then you need to get around some different people, period. I don't care if, it's, if, if, it's, I don't care if it is your mother or your father or your friends or your circle, whatever it is. You know, whoever's around you right now, they're not bringing any good to you. And if, if Rob wasn't bringing any good to you, why would you be sitting here talking to this man? You know, right. this is, he's adding value to your life every single day. And I've got people who have done more for me in my life as, as strangers than my own brother has done for me in 48 years of life. So why is it that I owe my own brother more loyalty 
than I owe the person who has done more for me in the, in, in the five mm. minutes that I've known them, the 10 minutes that I've known them. You know, so it, it's something, mm. there's something that needs to, there's, there's something that lends to be said about, you know, the circle that you carry yourself in. And sometimes we feel like we have to stay around certain people because this, is, feel where, indebted this to them, is where man. we came up, you know, this mm. is who we grew up around, you know, well, they're, they're not, they're family, not by, by choice. You know, mm. you, you don't get to choose your family. You know, you get to choose mm. the people you hang out with, though, right. that's for sure. You know, so, you know, I, when I spoke in my mom's funeral, it was very important for me to get across the point of, you know, liking somebody and loving somebody. You know, we, we love our family because what? We're supposed to, mm. right? It's, it, just, it just is what it is, you know, but I may not always like them. Let's, let's just keep it real. I may, not, I may not like my cousin. I may not like my sister or my brother, whatever the case is, you know, and that doesn't mean just because we come from the same bloodline that I have to be around you if you're toxic to me. Mm. Because I've met many, wow. many people where their mother or their father has been very, very toxic to them, and they have to break away from that situation, even if it's around strangers, and they've gone on to be very, very successful, mm. super successful, because if I'm going to lose all my brain cells trying to help somebody <laughs> who doesn't want to be helped, you know, I could put that value to somebody else who really needs it and really wants it. And that's oh. why, and when we reach back, yeah, that's that's the most important thing. Reach back after you go through your adversities, man, and try to understand that you were put here for your specific mm -hmm. person. My mom right now, God rest her soul, she has gone on to glory. She's going. She's at a place right now where I'm trying to get to. Exactly. You know. So this was this. Amen. That is proof that this place is temporary, and I've learned how to focus on the eternity. Mm -hmm. You know, not so much on what's going on right now in my life. And I'm, I'm able to walk away from things and I'm smiling differently and I'm able to carry myself differently because of the things that I've been through. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk too much here. You know, this is a, uh, I feel like I'm talking a lot. No, we love it. Please. No, no, please what, do. what I'm saying to you is that, you know, if it wasn't for my vision on eternity, mm. okay, I wouldn't be able to go through these things, man. It's, it's a package, you know, that grounding in, in God, the, the grounding in the spiritual walk. And that doesn't mean I'm a, you know, I walk around and I'm perfect and, you know, I'm, I'm what they call a Bible thumper or, right, you know, right, I'm right, holy, right, right. you know it, it has nothing to do with it. It just depends on who you are inside and who you really know right. Right, you are inside. You can't hide from this. That's right. You definitely can't hide from this. Yeah, I was gonna avoid. I mean, do you have you have a question? Because uh -huh. right, I was gonna avoid it because it seems like even though this is a fight over flight and this is a trauma base and how resiliency, resiliency, but it seemed like you know I'm just gonna ask. And if you're not comfortable talking about it, um, because your mom was such a staple in your life, yeah. And Thanksgiving was only it was less than a month ago, yeah. And you know she passes away. I mean, you seem like you're in high spirits because you know. She's in heaven. You know, she's, she's, she's in the glory of God, right? Rejoicing. You know, it's difficult, right? I mean, it still has to be difficult. I mean, so someone knowing now if they have a sick parent, you know, and they're in their 40s or they're in their 50s or they're in their 60s and their parent is in, you know, 70s, 80s, whatever. I mean, it's, it, it's ne I can't even imagine it could be ever easy yeah. to lose a parent, especially one that was a staple in your life. I cried this morning, man. You know, I cried this morning. And again, the sun came up whether I was crying or whether I was in pain or whether I went through something or not, the world doesn't really care about what we're going through. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's not heavy. You know, so I had to realize, you know, it, the, the decision to, um, I, I recall the day when I got the phone call about my mom. My sister was in the hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. She had taken the, uh, the ambulance to the hospital and she called me. She said, mom's here in the hospital again. You know, and the, 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 the bigger part of that is that my, my dad passed in 2018. My, oh. my stepfather oh. passed in 2018. So they were married for 47 years. Wow. You know, right after the, um, again, another adversity. You know, this was the man in my life that had made me into something better. You know, he showed me how to be a great um, dad and a stepdad. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that was huge, a huge loss for me. And just getting into that, I had just begun to, you know, take my mom out of, you know, out of that realm because it was very hard for her to deal with. And this is over the past couple of months, and I'm talking about early in 2019, where I'd, I'd taken her on a trip to see my sister in Georgia. It was her first time on a plane in <laughs> wow. years, and she, she would never leave because my dad was sick. She would never want to leave. And I told her, I said, Mama, I said, it's time for you to live now. It's time for you to have a great time. You've mm -hmm. taken care of, of Granny. You've taken care of Pop. You've taken care of your brothers. You know, it's time for you to have your life now. And probably about a month after that, she had a stroke. Wow. You know, and... You know, recovering from the, from the stroke, the first stroke she recovered from partially, you know, enough for us to have a conversation. 
you know, and it was, it was some of the greatest laughter that me and my mom had ever had because there was something about the stroke that released her from having mm-hmm. to impress people and, you know, and to be, you know, and to be, be uh, bound by what people thought of her. You know, and I remember, you know, sitting by, I was by the bedside every day and night, along with the rest of my family and yeah. friends and girls and a girlfriend and things like that. You know, we were, you know, there and, you know, but I spent most of my time at the hospital. And as she was overcoming that situation, you know, we, we had a chance to talk. And she, she said something very, very special to me that she had never said to me before. You know, I, I always knew mom loved me. You know, we always knew mom loved us and things like that. It's, those are words we never had to say, mm-hmm. right? We didn't grow up saying the word I love you so much and things like that. We just knew. We showed it. Um, but she laughed and she smiled and we had a, a good giggle. And she said to me, she said, you know what, Joey? She said, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. She said, That's she cool. Said, she, said, she said, I like you. And, and that for me, you know, um, it, it broke me yeah. Yeah. right there. Because that's, that goes back to what we talked about, about how you're teaching me things on your, on your transitional bed mm. right now, how you know, important it is for me to like other people as well. I don't have to be around you if I don't like you. Mm. you know, but it just shows that my mom and I, you know, the fact that she likes me as a son probably meant more than the fact that she loved me as a son because she loved me unconditionally. That mm. was easy. But... Can we go back to what I said? We love people that we don't like, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, the fact that she said that to me, I just, I just broke down at that moment. And I couldn't, I couldn't pull myself back together because that meant the world to me. Yeah. And I'll, I'll always keep that with me forever. So while she was in the hospital, I'm feeling we're doing better. I go back to work. I get the phone call the following morning from my sister. Mommy just had another stroke. And this one was, was bad. You know, when I get to the hospital and I'm still dressed full uniform and mm-hmm. I get to the hospital and, and, you know, I look at the, the CAT scans. I look at all the, you know, the, the results of what, what I'm looking at. And I, and I look at the doctor and I say, doc, I said, let me ask you something. I said, I need you to be completely honest with me. I said, let's take these uniforms off. Let's take the white coats off. Let's, let's talk as men. If this is your mom, what do you do? You know, what do you, what do you see here? That, and, and he looked at me and said, she's not likely to recover from this. You know, so now, now you have to mix that spiritual part of, of that along with what you're seeing in the natural, mm-hmm. what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the medical files. I'm looking at this screen. I'm, I'm listening to these professionals who, who have done things the same way we've been doing things in our career for, for how long. So if somebody comes up to me and asks me something about the law, I'm good. I know it. Yep. Okay, they come mm-hmm. to me for that purpose. So I'm going to go to this doctor and try to ask this doctor, say, listen, you, I'm, I'm coming to you right now because I don't know what this is supposed to look like. I don't know what this is supposed to feel like, so I need you to be completely honest with me as a man and tell me what am I supposed to do here. And don't lie to me. You know, don't, don't BS me here. Let's, let's, let's talk like men. And, he, and that was the conversation that we had there. She wasn't likely to recover. Wow. You know, so she went on, and you know, my sister was, uh, was, was very, very influential. My other sister, my older sister, very, they were great, awesome. They took care of her and things like that the best that they possibly can. Mm. We even got her home. You know, and then until this recent time when she went back to the hospital and, mm-hmm. you know, she uh, this time she didn't, you know, she didn't come up. She didn't come back home, you know, and um, this was a week after the after the surgery of uh, my shoulder surgery. So now I'm trying to overcome the pain right. of the surgery. And I remember calling my sister back at the hospital saying, I said, you need me to come. I just took painkillers from my from yeah, my yeah. shoulder. <laughs> but I can take an Uber over to the hospital if you need me to. And, you know, our women in the family, what do they do? Nah, we're good. We got it. You know, we're just, you know, you just, you just chill, just rest and things like that. And, and I remember the morning, it was, it was Thanksgiving morning and it was, uh, it was 4 a.m. And I had just went to sleep probably around 12.05. And I remember distinctly and I took the, took the painkillers. Mom's in the hospital. I'm feeling she's okay. Um, I got to take my sister's advice and I, I wake up four o'clock in the morning. Wow. And it was, and, and when I woke up, it was like a different type of energy, man. It was a different type of feel. And probably 30 seconds after that, I reached out to text my sister, how's mom? And they said, she just coded, you know, that she just, you know, they, they're bringing in the crash cart and things like that. So she was coding as I was waking up. Wow. You know, there was something that was going on that woke me up out of that moment saying, listen, you got to go into action now, no matter what your situation is, no matter what the, the pain killers, how much pain you're in, it's time for you to function overcoming that adversity, right? All those things I've been through, sparring, you know, those things back in the day. And, 
you know, I, I get to the hospital and, you know, before I get to the hospital, I wake up my little girl. I said, baby girl, I said, remember I told you I may have to go to the hospital in the middle of the night. And she says to me, she says, yeah. I said, do you want to come with me? So she says, um, she says, no, daddy, you go. And I said, baby, I think you should come. Wow. I think you should come. And it was at that moment I knew that um, mom wasn't coming back. It was something about that day. So I had, I had to try to make sense of this about how, you know, her favorite holiday, my mother, that's what she did. She fed people. Mm. Right? She, you know, she was a cook. She was a caterer. You know, she ran the hospitality at wow. the church. You know, she was the church mother, you know, and everybody her her cornbread stuff and is famous yeah. oh, from here man. across the country, baby. <laughs> you know, my sister tried it this year, but she's 0 for 1, you know. She's, but, but she killed the macaroni and cheese. Though. She's 0 for you know, 1. Yeah, she's 0 for never 1. Never like mama, right, never. Right, right. You know, she killed the macaroni and cheese, though. But, you know, it, it was... You know, I had to think about it. Like every year I'm frying the turkey and mom is, is there. You know, every, every year I'm outside on the deck and she's, and she's inside. She's roasting. She's doing things. This was her favorite holiday. She loved to see people eat. She loved to feed people. So I had to, I had to go back and I'm like, what is, what is this, the significance of this? You know, I'm speaking to my lady and I'm like, well, what is the significance of this, of her dying on Thanksgiving Day? You know, like what is, like this is her day. Like this is what she looked for every year, mm. you know, and. I would have taken her shopping for the Thanksgiving food, you know, by then I would have, I would have done all these things every, every single year. And, and what happened was it came to me middle of the night again, you know, you fed so many people all your entire life. Now it's time for you to eat. Hmm. You know, now it's time for you to be at the best table, the best Thanksgiving table ever. You know what I mean? So now, and, and as she's transitioning on that day, as hard as it was and as much as it hurt, I'm just picturing her sitting at the, the greatest table the greatest Thanksgiving feast that can yep. ever be had by Amen. any kind of person in the world, you know, and, and, and I know dad is there and I know granny Amen. is there and I know her brothers are there and they're just like, come on, we've been waiting. We knew, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, we knew you were yeah, coming. We're waiting today. for you to cook. Right, now, come right, on. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, we knew you were coming, even though you didn't know. And, you know, and, and this was a day that, you know, she didn't have to cook. She didn't have to clean up. Right. You know? She didn't have to prepare and things like that. She was the guest of honor on that day, you know, and, and that was something that that was the only that was the best way for me to look at something like that, uh, because I'm I'm again questioning God. You know that doesn't matter. It doesn't mean just because we we're spiritual and things that we don't have questions for God. Because Absolutely. sometimes like oh, yeah. I'm like, hey, all the time, bruh, you got you <laughs> yeah. got to you got to give me some help on this one. And um, you know I I pictured her sitting at that table, and and every night you know from that point from this day on you know from that that day on you know I wake up with this empty feeling. I wake up with a piece of me missing. And uh, yeah, I hear you. I think that's a yeah, that's a a yeah. big thing to take on. Yeah, and I and and thank you for sharing. And I really appreciate you sharing because you know there's no love like a mother's love, and and to hear that she was such a staple in your life, and to hear, and I mean, I just wish I could have met her. Uh, you know, you are, you are right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So thank you for sharing that because I know that couldn't have been easy. Oh, man. And and I actually held back. I didn't want to ask, but I also know that people who lose their mom, they need to know that, or lose a parent, they need to know that they're not alone. Yeah. And Hold, hold and, holding back is not going to help anybody yeah. else. You know, and that's the one thing that we're here for. I mean, we're we're here to do what? We're that's here right. to help people. We're not here for us. That's right. right. You know, we're here to help other people. And how are we going to do that unless we're transparent? That's right. You that's know, right. there was a whole big. Uh, Going, th going through that with the, with, the, with the arm and my mom at that time, you know, I was on painkillers, you know, and as much as we don't like to take painkillers, mm -hmm. I had to take it. You know, I was yeah, like, okay, I, I got to, yeah. this is something. And, and, and I kept it as limited as possible because I know what the effects have been, you know, through law enforcement and, you know, through abuse and yep. misuse of, of drugs and alcohol and things like that. And, you know, going through this physical pain and then adding an emotional pain on top of that, and I'm not just talking about a regular emotional pain. No. I'm yeah. talking about moms. Yeah. You know, this is mom dukes. This is, this is right. the one. And, um, you know, for a moment with those painkillers, I'm not saying I would ever do it, but I understood. Like, I got it. And there was something that came to me and I said, ah, I get it. Yep. I get how people can get hooked on certain things even though they don't want to. This wasn't a plan for people to get hooked on painkillers yep. or, or addiction or drugs or alcohol. It wasn't, it wasn't their plan. Right. You know? I can imagine when, yeah. you, uh, when you don't have anything to rely on, it's easy to rely on something like that, something super, synthetic. Super, super, super easy. And I had to push that ball away and just give me the Advil. 
Yeah. You know, give me the Tylenol, whatever the case was. And, you know, it can be super, super easy because it was there at my disposal, right. you know, to just be reach over to the side of the bed and it's there as mm. many as I want, you know, and, wow. you know, following mom's death, I, I went to the dentist, mm-hmm. you know, and I had to get, you know, you got to have the, the teeth right, yeah, you know, yeah, be on yeah. camera, things <laughs> like, you know, so um, I had, a, I had a tooth pulled and I had an implant put in and what did they do? They drill into the bone, they drill into mm. your jaw. Mm-hmm. And then what does the doctor give you? Pain meds. Pain meds. You know, and I'm like, <sighs> and he said, and, and he gives you the, 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 the conversation. Um, you can, you're going to expect to be uncomfortable later. <laughs> that's not uncomfortable. Doc. That's pain. You know, so even then I had to choose to just leave it alone. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't do it because very, very simple, very, very easy to get hooked and get caught up in a situation like that. The, the physical pain, the emotional pain, and then more physical pain. Mm-hmm. And if your life is not grounded, Right. If you're not spiritually grounded to understand that there's something greater for you after this, you can easily be lost just like the rest of them. You're no different. I'm no different than every other man or any other person out here in the world. Yeah, I have, so, a, I have a very good friend who, who passed, and that was part of the reason. Uh, he lost his father a year prior, and him and his dad were very, very close. Uh, and he went to the pain meds and alcohol on top of it. Yeah. And uh, combining all that, you know, um, opioids, you know, and that just kind of did him in. He yeah. couldn't, he couldn't control it. I mean, the, the death itself was a lot, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was something that I realized that I, I, after going to the, I went to the doctor the following morning of my mom's death, the day after Thanksgiving. And I said, I just want to go home and lay down, man. Yeah. I just want to go home and rest. Cause I'm still in disbelief that my mom, you know, is not here anymore, but I can't, mm-hmm. I got a funeral to plan. Yeah. You know, and then that's when this stuff really kicks in. We right. realize, like, okay, you have to plan this thing. You have to get this this, yep. this thing done. Nobody's going to come to the funeral if you don't start the process of getting it done. And all that week, again, it was easy access if I chose to. But thank God I didn't choose to. Mm. Thank God I chose other I had people that surrounded me. I had people, mm. you know, people of love. And, you know, I was able to reach out to people and talk to other people about it. You know, and understand that that day was coming. That day of that funeral was coming, no matter what. Mm-hmm. You know, that sun is going to come on Saturday, whether I'm here or whether I'm not here, whether I'm mentally right or whether I'm not mentally right. That mm-hmm. day is coming and it's going to be a surrounding of people looking at my mom and her casket. It's going to be a surrounding of people mourning and crying and, you know, hundreds of people and things like that. And you need to be prepared for that because there's nothing stopping that day from coming. Right. Other than, other than your own mortality. Yeah. It's a great you know, perspective. There's nothing stopping it. So if I know that at that day is coming and I don't have any control of the days or the sun or the hours or, you know, that's not me. That's, that's all God. He controls all that. I need to be able to be prepared for that day. Mm. No matter what, no matter how much it's going to hurt, I'm still Amen coming. That. that day is still coming. So um, it's the preparation of it all, man. Yeah. And what you're doing, we'll take law enforcement aside because that, the service and the protection and everything that speaks for itself. But what you're doing with your movement and what we're doing with ours just interconnects so well because you, you pointed to it before. We want to serve people. Yeah. And this is for the listeners. And this is to get them so they don't... That fine line, that resilient line is very fine so that they don't spiral down when they lose a parent, when they have to get a new kidney, mm-hmm. when they have to... When they get cancer major car accident that just completely shifts their life whatever the trauma is we want them to stay on that right line to spiral up not spiral down and that's why watching you i mean i i watch you all the time obviously on social media then we we got to meet at dunkin donuts and talk and and hang out every time i speak to you i'm more and more inspired And, and it's like we're pushing this movement and i'm still inspired so I can't even imagine the person that's sitting in their room listening or the person that's just watching your, your Instagram, how much you're moving in their life. That's right. Because you're moving in my life, and, and, and I know you already. Yeah, yeah. How's that? To so someone, to, to a complete stranger, to say, look at all this stuff this person went through. And he's a father. He's a great man. He's serving people. He's living life to his fullest. After all of that. You can't help but be inspired. I'm humbled, man. Oh. I'm greatly humbled. And listen, yes. you, you're st- I've heard your story too, man. I've heard your story. Listen, if it wasn't, um, and, and I too was inspired by your story with the epilepsy. I was inspired by your story mm-hmm. with the vertigo. And um, I don't want you to, to count that as robbery, man, because trust me when I tell you, as I'm watching your podcast at home, um, I'm looking and I'm saying, listen, if these guys can get up after what they've gone through, then why can't I? 
Mm. You know, and that's what this whole thing is about. If you can, you know, I started to, to, to look at life as if this person can get through it, then why can't I? Right. You know, why can't, what's, what's stopping me other than me from getting through this emotional process or this physical process? And like you said, no matter what, if, if, you're, if you're going through something right now, just realize that while that is your reality, it doesn't mean that you, that you can't get through it. You need to get up and fight. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm not going to accept this anymore. I'm not going to be abused anymore. I'm not going to have anybody talk to me any only way they want to talk to me. I'm not going to be mistreated anymore. I'm not going to allow the drugs to take over me, the alcohol take over me. Whatever your fight is right now, I don't know what your fight is, your specific fight, but whatever your fight is, you need to fight. There's going to be a time in your life where you have to fight whether you like it or not. That's right. I don't, I don't care who you are. There were times in school where, listen, I, listen, I, 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 I remember getting bullied, Amen. man. Yeah. But there was a time when I had to knuckle up and let's see. Okay, let's yep. get it. I may lose That's it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I may, wear, I may wear something, but trust me, you're not leaving without this. Mm-hmm. You know what That's I mean? Right. So this is, you know, and that has nothing to do with ego or, you know, or being, you know, the, the macho man. It's just fighting is fighting. You you're not going to get through life without finding some type of fight. I don't care what it is. You, you won't make it through. That's right. I promise. People say, well, you know, don't speak it into existence. No, no, I'm not speaking <laughs> anything into existence. Right. I'm telling you from experience. That's right. I'm not preaching to you because as nice of a guy as I am, and I like to think I'm a nice guy, mm-hmm. I don't hurt people. Mm-hmm. I never set out to hurt people. Mm-hmm. Um, I still had to fight. Storm still, is coming. Storm is coming, whether, whether you like it or not. Mm-hmm. And and if you're not prepared in a certain type of fashion, in any kind of way, you won't make it. You know, you won't make it. So you need to be, I realized that even when my mom died, my kids are still here. <laughs> right. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I got I to be there for my baby girl. You know, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to stop her from raising up and growing up. You know, so until you realize that you need to fight in life and nobody's coming to save you right now, you won't make it. I promise you, you won't make it. And it's going to lead you to, a, to a, a different source, whether it be drugs or whether it be alcohol or whether it be a gang or whether it be somebody who's just going to accept you the way you are. You need to realize that you're going to have to fight something. in life. Yep. Amen. So, that. So. I love that. I think that that's a great note to kind of wrap things up yeah. with. That's I may run through the wall instead of using the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Hey, man, I, I yeah. appreciate it, man. It, it, it's, not, it's not for me. Yeah. You know, my, my adversities weren't given to me for me. Yeah. It was given to me for somebody else. And Amen. Whoever, whoever hears it, you know, God bless them. Yeah. And I, I can also say, like, having sat down with you for the first time right now, um, it's very easy to be, be incredibly inspired and motivated to take things on that I would have ne- normally not been able to take on. You know, so it's uh, your message is getting across very clearly, and I'm grateful for it. Very clearly. Yeah. I appreciate that. Now, just before we wrap up, we're going to going to close this out let people know where they can find you again and what's maybe your next projects and anything you want the listeners to know the floor is yours yeah absolutely you know right now we're looking into our we're looking into our own podcast coming in 2020 and um overcoming adversity and again it's it's something that 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 needs to be understood that you're going to have to fight in life so this is something that that i've been very very heavy with and it's been on my spirit god placed it upon my spirit to to do this and right now uh, you could find me at JH Overcomes on Facebook, JH Overcomes on Instagram, or you can just find me under Joe Hammond. And again, if you need something, if you need some kind of help, I can't promise you that I can help every situation, but I will point you in the right direction. I got resources. We all got resources, and I promise you we're going to use them all. Love it. So. Beautiful. Thank right, you so guys. much for co- for joining us for Fight Over Flight. Uh, if you're watching, like, share, subscribe, leave a review, leave a little comment for Joe, and uh, thank you guys again for sitting through this. God bless. God bless. Thank you.